All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time that uh, those of you at home are watching our message for today. This is Saturday, April the 4th, I believe. Yes, April the 4th. Um, tomorrow is Palm Sunday, so we're doing an Easter message, a couple of Easter messages. Um, we're going to be talking about some things relating to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and the resurrection uh, because of the season, but then also um, afterwards, because it looks like we're in this for the long haul. Uh, we're going to then be doing some studies in the book of Acts until we're able to come back together. But anyway, I uh, want to let uh, those of you know in our church family, we miss you. And uh, I was thinking, you know, we're probably going to come back, when we come back together, when they turn us all loose, uh, we'll be able to come back together, probably have a greater appreciation for our church family. It's real easy to take the, the normal routine for granted, but um, it's a wonderful treasure to have. There's a lot of folks that don't have a Grace Church to meet with and to fellowship with and to have God's Word taught, rightly divided, and have the fellowship. Um, we, have, we live in a wonderful day where we can use computer and technology and stay connected in so many wonderful ways, but there's no substitute for a local church, for its ministry together and for its outreach. So um, anyway, we're grateful for the technology. Um, we're going to have, uh, have a, a, a time together. Uh, I wanted this morning, or this evening, or this afternoon, it's a uh, force of habit. I'm here at church. By the way, I want this to look like church, and I forgot my tie. So isn't it wonderful not to be, not to be locked in to, uh, to write and ritual and form and so on? But uh, I apologize. I know none of you are, are offended that I don't have a tie on. Uh, I did forget that. I will try to have that next week. You can tell that my wife isn't here because she would have certainly reminded me uh, had, that, uh, had that been the case. We're here, Hannah's here recording the, the message for us. This is Saturday afternoon, as I said. We'll try to have it up Sunday morning for you. Okay, um, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to talk about the resurrection both this week and next week. This morning, this afternoon... <laughs> Force a habit. I'm sorry. Uh, today, <laughs> we're going to talk about what the resurrection means to God the Father. Uh, and I'd like to read a passage here, um, Matthew chapter 27, and I'd like to begin verse 31 to 51. Uh, this is the actual crucifixion as it's recorded in the book of Matthew. Matthew 27, verse 31. Here's God's word. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set over his head an accusation written, This is King of the Jew. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Bunch of liars. <laughs> he trusted in God. Him deliver him now, if he will save him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus said with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calls for Eliath. 
And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The earth also did quake, and the rocks rent. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look into it and to, uh, to fellowship together around thy eternal truth. And we thank you as we consider some things about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that uh, these things would be near and dear to our hearts and give us a greater appreciation of our Savior and the life that we share and the confidence we have because, of, because he is indeed risen from the dead. We serve a living Savior, and we're grateful for that. We thank you so much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's something marvelous that takes place at his resurrection. Here is the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a marvelous sign given. Um, there in verse 45, from the sixth hour, there was a darkness over the land unto the ninth hour. The sun was turned black. And darkness covered the land there. What an amazing sign. You know, not just a momentary, you know, eclipse like we see, but for several hours there was darkness. You think the world would have taken note that something's going on, especially those people there. This is that that that's symbolic of the judgment of God that was falling on Jesus Christ. And that judgment was falling, and uh, it was the darkest hour in human history. A crisis had come. The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ had come to the nation of Israel and been rejected and brutally murdered and crucified there. It was not just a sign of the world's rebellion and rejection of Jesus Christ. It was a sign of God's wrath also on the Lord Jesus Christ. A dark time, a dark day. And yet three days later, the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I want to talk to you today about the resurrection as it, and, and what it meant to God the Father. There is something marvelous that takes place kind of beneath the surface. It's not talked about, uh, but it's in plain view if you study God's Word and, you, and you, you're, you're familiar with what is being said. Um, turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 1. There is a, there is a declaration made by God the Father to God the Son the day of His resurrection. It's a marvelous statement. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's a sign. It's a sign from God the Father. And their fellowship was restored. And it's a marvelous prophetic statement. It's, it's, it's first given to us back in the Old Testament. But as, as it's read back in the Old Testament, the, 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 the meaning is clouded. And the meaning is unclear. But as we come and we put all of these things together in God's Word from, from the book of Romans, the book of Psalms, the book of Acts, and the book of Hebrews, we realize it's a marvelous statement. And we've talked to you the last couple weeks about, first, the course of this world, that the course of this world is, is the, 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 the events of these current times are nothing new. The world's on a course, and it's, it's heading toward calamity and judgment. God's course the next week we talk to you about God's purpose is still on course. In spite of all the chaos in the world, in spite of man's rejection and wickedness and sin, God's course and His purpose is, is still in place and marches on. And we can be grateful for that. Well, there's a marvelous sign that God's course is still on track to accomplish His purpose. And it's a, it's a statement that's made that indicates that at the very day of the Lord's resurrection. And it tells us what the resurrection meant to God the Father. So here, you, I've asked you to turn to the book of Romans. As Paul receives his apostleship, he establishes his authority. And um, Romans chapter number 1, the first verse, first four verses, Paul talks about his apostleship. Um, he's a servant of God, separated unto the gospel of God. Verse 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, 
Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection sent a signal because of a declaration that God made concerning His Son that very day. Now, Paul doesn't give us the statement here, but he, he gives us an inkling into the, 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 the meaning of the resurrection and the significance of the resurrection as far as God the Father is concerned. Declared to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness, uh, by the resurrection from the dead. Let's give a little background here. Uh, God is going to tell us. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. God is going to make a statement um, demonstrating that this was not a mere man that was in this tomb that was risen from the dead, that now was empty the third day. No, the Lord Jesus Christ was somebody special. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse 4, the apostle says, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. What a great verse about our hope and our um, confidence because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, next week we're going to talk about what the resurrection means to us. But first we want to see what it means to God. Paul here says, though he was crucified in weakness, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself up as a sacrifice and an offering for sin there. He, he, he was betrayed into the hands of men. They taunted him when he was on the cross. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe him. Bunch of liars. They had ample evidence that he was the Son of God prior to that. They didn't care. Uh, they, were, they were in direct defiance of God himself. Yet he liveth by the power of God. The prophet writes, there was no form or comeliness that, that, uh, that we should desire him. He grew, he, he grew up as a, as a root out of, di, out of dry ground. Um, as a lamb was, a, was led to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers are dumb, Isaiah chapter 53. He was crucified in weakness, but he certainly was, was not weak. He was the Son of God. There's that song that, uh, that is sung, He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could, that, that, that's stated for us in the book of Matthew also. He was the Son of God. He had authority and power. But he was crucified in weakness. Come with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 2. Let's get a little background. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, he came in humble beginnings. His conception Born, uh, conceived, virgin, virgin conceived in, in Mary's womb and was born uh, a babe in Bethlehem. And uh, no, nothing, no, no great fanfare other than the angels appearing to the, to the shepherds. But he came in weakness, grew up as a man and uh, uh, began his public ministry at, uh, at, at the age of 30. The book of Acts here, uh, after, the, after the crucifixion and after the resurrection and after the ascension, Peter is preaching here. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. The Lord Jesus Christ was born in, uh, in, in natural fashion, but when he began his public ministry, it was accompanied by miracles and wonders and signs. In fact, at his, bat at his baptism, there was a voice from heaven declaring that he was the Son of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 says. And in, in Mark, the, vo the voice, it, 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 it is said in Mark, the Father spoke to him, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. All heard that he was the Son of God, and uh, it, it was declared. And yet, as Jesus came with the signs and wonders, verse 23 says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God delivered him. Special delivery, we could say. He was delivered to the nation of Israel. The, the John chapter 3 and verse 
16, the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I would remind us that John 3.16 is a pre-crucifixion verse, not announcing his death, his coming death for sin, although ultimately that's involved, but that hadn't been revealed yet. God gave his son to the nation of Israel. Isaiah chapter 6. For unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he shall be called the Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9 goes on to talk about that he's the king. And, and, and of his government, he'll sit on the throne of David, and of his government there shall be no end. The, the Lord Jesus Christ was delivered, special delivery to the nation of Israel, given to them. A pre-crucifixion statement about him being the king. He was delivered to the nation of Israel. And yet, he was rejected. Had all the signs and wonders of his power. Had all the signs of the world to come. And yet he was rejected. He came into his own and his own received him not. Verse 23 here says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. There's his, there's his crucifixion. He was delivered to the nation of Israel. And he laid aside the exercise of his divine power according to the plan and purpose of God right on schedule and gave himself as a sacrifice into the hands of fallen men. And with wicked hands they crucified and, and slew him according to the plan and the purpose of God. You didn't believe him. You knew he was the son of God because of the sons, but you denied him. You divide, de denied the, the coming of the just one. And he says, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. That's what we read over there in Matthew chapter 27. They didn't believe that he was the son of God. But here's this marvelous declaration. Um, verse 24, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Death had no claim upon him. He voluntarily yielded up the ghost. He, he, they didn't take his life from him. He yielded it up. Marvelous statement of power. And though he was crucified in weakness, in power he dismissed his spirit and yielded up the ghost. And for three days, according to the prophecy and according to the words he said concerning Jonah, as, the son of, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right on schedule, ticking off the, prophet, the prophecies, the Lord Jesus Christ waited till the appointed time and rose from the dead. He says, I have power to lay my life down, and I have power to take it again. This power I've given from my Father. God raised, it wasn't possible. He came out by choice, rose from the dead, with the power of, of, of the Godhead behind him and the power of the Godhead within him. Great statement. God raised him because it wasn't possible for him to be held there. At his crucifixion, there was a great sign of the darkness that came over from the, uh, from the, from the, the sixth hour to the, to the ninth hour. I, I, I'm not quoting that properly. But there was a sign there. Here's a great sign to the nation of Israel and to the world. The sign of the prophet Jonas, risen from the dead. Uh, a great sign in power. Peter goes on to talk here in verse 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29 that David spoke about it. A prophecy back in, in, in Psalm 16. And uh, later he's going to refer to Psalm 110. But even there, in David's prophecy, it's, it's veiled. And as, the, as they read those things, they, it says, The prophets inquired and searched diligently about the, the, the sufferings of Christ and the glory to follow. Uh, we now know, and Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, puts the meaning to Psalm 16 that uh, wouldn't suffer his Holy One to see corruption. David speaks about it. Down to verse 30, let's pick up reading again. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ 
to sit on his throne. He made that promise and that declaration to David, the great Davidic covenant. And God's word is coming to, coming to pass just as God said, it, said he would. God's course, even after the darkest hour in human history, God's purpose and God's plan marches on. Christ was raised up for a purpose. He says here to sit on David's throne. He is the king. And his resurrection proves it. And the prophet David in Psalm 16 foretold it. Verse, 20, verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Peter says he's raised to sit on David's throne. His claim of, of kingship and the message that we preach, the king, and he preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the gospel of the kingdom is still in effect. You didn't stop God's purpose by killing him. God's purpose is still right on course, just like he said he would, and just like he said it would. He says, we're witnesses of this. Verse 33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. The events on the day of Pentecost were prophesied. Peter says, He's risen. He's seated at the Father's right hand, and He's exalted. And He's the one that poured out the Spirit. The promise, just like He gave to us, and just like the promise of the Father back in the Old Testament. Here it is. Great declaration. And the program and the purpose is right on course, just like God said it would be. And he says this is poured out. And uh, verse 34, David is not ascended into the heavens. Not David that's up there. He says, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Jesus Christ is sitting at the Father's right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. There's the second coming. He's going to come back and pour out his wrath just like the scriptures said it would. The purpose is marching right on. His purpose is right on track, just like God said it would. And he's, then there's the invitation and the declaration in verses 36 to 38, the invitation to the nation of Israel to again receive their Messiah. And then he, the invitation is reiterated over in chapter number 3 that the, that the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ back. Oh, the course of God is right on track. Well, in the midst of this, here's the context. There's this marvelous statement of God the Father to the Son the day of his resurrection. I want to put it in, put it in context. Go back with me to Psalms chapter number 2. Let's look at, the, at, a, at a prophecy back here in the book of Psalms about this very time. And in this, this very familiar prophecy in Psalm chapter 2, you know I've, I've referred to it often, there's a statement by God the Father to God the Son the day of His resurrection. Psalm chapter 2. And notice who is speaking back and forth here in the second Psalm. It starts out, David speaks. As he's writing, he, he's writing prophetically. David speaks prophetically. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, David is speaking prophetically. Acts chapter 4, he identifies this. The heathen are the Gentiles. The people are the people of Israel. The kings of the earth are Herod and Pontius Pilate all gathered together against the Lord and against the, the Lord, that's Jehovah in verse 2, and against his anointed. And they're speaking, and David speaks prof prophetically about them at that time, the type and the crucifixions. Verse 3, now man speaks. <laughs> Let us break their bands asunder cast and cast away their cords from us. Let's get rid of them. They're rocking the boat. They're upsetting the apple cart. Let's get rid of them. David speaks prophetically. Let's, the, the scripture here gives us a window into their motivation and their heart and their, 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 their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. David begins to speak again, providing commentary in verse 4. 
he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. They don't know what they're doing. And the sun is up there. There's his ascension. You have the crucifixion. You have his ascension. And Jesus Christ is sitting at the Father's right hand. He's just laughing at them. How foolish to think that they could thwart God's purpose. It's marching on. Verse 5, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. The reaction prophetically to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ standing up and making his foes his footstool and coming back in vengeance and wrath. The purpose here prophetically is, is laid out for us. And here's, this, here's his second coming spoken of there in verse number 5. Now in verse 6, this is all set up. We're getting ready now to have this declaration, this proclamation of God the Father to God the Son. The Father speaks in verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. There's a Zion in the heavens and a Zion on the earth. And Jesus Christ is setting there as a royal exile. He says in verse 7, I, the Father, the, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. Now here in verse 7, the Lord Jesus Christ begins to speak here. He says, I will declare the decree the Lord, that's Jehovah, that's the Father, hath said unto me. Jesus Christ is now going to speak Words that the Father spoke to him. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ walking in faith. I will declare the decree. The Son speaks. The Lord, that's the God the Father, has said unto me. Here's the proclamation. Here's the declaration. Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. As we read that, we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, the begetting, God gave His only begotten Son. That was a pre-crucifixion statement about his, about his incarnation and birth. Here, we're in the context of the second coming. This day have I begotten thee. That's not a reference back to His birth. It, it is. I'll let you in on the, on the analogy. We'll see why. This is a declaration. The day is the day of his resurrection. This day have I begotten thee. I'll show you why in a moment. But look now in verse, uh, verse 8. More words of the Father that Jesus Christ is speaking. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Just ask. And I'll give you the whole shooting match, he says. I'll give you the heathen as a possession. And the uttermost parts of the earth will be yours. A proclamation of wrath. Verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. There's the second coming and judgment there. So here the Father says, just ask. <laughs> Just ask, and I'll give you the heathen, and I'll give you the earth for your possession. And you're going to judge them, and you're going to take it all and possess the earth and the Gentiles, and it's all going to be yours. That's the purpose of God. And, and it's, it's marching right on. The Father makes a declaration here that the Son reiterates, verse 7, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee. What a pro pro proclamation. Jesus speaks the Father's words that the Father speaks to him at the resurrection. They had a conversation that day. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. The Lord Jesus Christ knew what he meant. And we'll see the other references in Scripture that <laughs> Jesus Christ knew what it meant too. And it will, it will let us in on this wonderful declaration here. David continues in verse 10, though, of Psalm 2. 
Be wise. Now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed. Read the tea leaves. <laughs> See what's going on. <laughs> ye judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Recognize who he is before he gets really mad. <laughs> oh, the, the, the purpose of God is marching on. And there's this declaration here by the Lord Jesus Christ. This phrase here in verse 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, is found two, place, two other places in the scripture. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrew, the Hebrew writer speaks and, and reiterates this, this great statement here. Hebrews chapter number 1. The introduction of the book of Hebrews is the, 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 the Hebrew perspective of the glory of their Messiah. Um, he's spoken unto us by his son, verse 2, whom he hath appointed heir uh, of all things by whom he made the world. He's the creator and he's the heir. He's the creator and he's the heir. Here's his essence in verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath himself purged our sins, there's his crucifixion, he purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He jumps from the crucifixion through the resurrection to the ascension and like Acts 2 says and like Psalm 2 says he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high verse 4 being made so much better than the angels as hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they because he's, he's the heir verse 5 for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son this day have I begotten thee? There's that declaration again. But we're really not told specifically what that day is. But it's the day that he's declared to be the Son of God. Here in Hebrews, he's the Son of God. He's the heir. He's the firstborn of the Father, it's said elsewhere. <laughs> That's what the firstborn was. He was the heir, given all things that were, that were possessed by the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ is the rightful heir of the entire universe here. And he's, he's my son. This day have I begotten thee. The book of Colossians says he's the first begotten from the dead. When the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he was the, he was the, the only begotten son, but he became the first begotten son, the firstborn from the dead, declared to be the heir the rightful heir of all things. It's a glorious thing. This phrase here, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, is also quoted by the Apostle Paul. Come over to the, with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter 13. As we tie all this together, that declaration, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, tells us what the resurrection meant to God the Father. He is declaring Him to be the Son of God with power. He's declaring Him to be the firstborn from the dead. He's declaring Him to be the Son, the, the heir of all things. Acts chapter 13, as Paul is preaching out among the Gentiles now, Paul too is proclaiming the resurrection to the nation of Israel. Acts chapter 13, 28 and 29 he talks about the, the, the fact that he was crucified and they fulfilled all things that were written of him and, and he, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the sepulcher. Verse 30, but God raised him from the dead and he was seen many days of them which came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses unto, all, unto the people and we declare unto the glad tidings unto you the glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers Peter says, we're preaching some good news to you, a promise that was made unto the fathers. Here it is, verse 33. 
This ties all this together because in verse 33 we see that statement once again. God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up Jesus again as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. You know what the day is? It's the day of his resurrection. And there was a proclamation that God had made in the scriptures about a conversation that was had between the son and the father the day of his resurrection. Thou art my son. This day, the day of your resurrection, have I begotten thee. Colossians chapter 1 says he's the first begotten from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. And he's appointed the heir of all things. You know what God is saying? My son I raised up. He's my son. That's his nature. But he's also the heir. He's going to take possession of the heavens and the earth. All he's got to do is ask. And I'll give it to him. And he's going to execute judgment. He's going to dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And, and, and take possession of heaven and earth. What a declaration. When the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that was a joyous time. And fellowship had been restored between he and the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead, appears pre, uh, early in the morning to, 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 to Mary Magdalene in, Act, in John chapter 20, and then ascends up to the Father and presents himself there, and then comes back and begins his 40-day ministry with the disciples. But he has been declared, and the, and the scriptures declare for us the meaning of that statement that God was telling the Lord Jesus Christ, you're the heir you're, uh, in whom I'm well pleased, and you're my firstborn son, and you're going to take possession of the earth, and you're going to sit on that throne forever. And uh, the purpose of God is right on course. The resurrection... And the, and the crucifixion, when he was crucified in weakness, it did not thwart the purpose of God. The darkest day in history, when, when man and Satan threw their best at God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't thwart God's purpose one bit. In fact, he planned it, <laughs> planned for it. They executed it of their own free will. With wicked hands, they crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. What a glorious proclamation and the, the, the stage was set Psalm 2 says when he r r rises from the dead and sitting in heaven then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure that taking possession that dashing them to pieces like a potter's vessel and with a rod of iron should have happened 2,000 years ago so you say what happened to God's purpose? What happened to God's plan? <laughs> well, God had another purpose hidden in himself, and he makes known a new purpose. He interrupts prophecy, saves Saul of Tarsus there in the middle portion of the book of Acts, and sends him out with a new message. And the resurrection is key in that message too. And here's Paul telling us, <coughs> excuse me, about that resurrection. And Paul goes on to preach about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God raised him with power and, and, and a promise of a, of a Savior and a King to the nation of Israel. The sure mercies of David in verse 34. Paul goes on to preach about the resurrection in verse 37 and 38. He says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now Paul is describing some things that are transpiring in his ministry that are outside of that prophetic program. Paul has been ministering here now for, for several years by the time Acts 13 rolls around. We're, we're several years removed from the day of Pentecost and the actual event. And Paul here says, all that believe 
are justified from all things by which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And the resurrection is key. You're here in Acts 14. Go to Acts 17. Paul preached the resurrection out among the Gentiles as a key part of his message and ministry. And he's preaching here in Athens, on that great sermon on, on Mars Hill. He says, he, he had said in Acts 13, Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and all that can believe are justified from all things. He preached it to the Jews there in the synagogue in Antioch. Now he's preaching it to the Gentiles many years later on Mars Hill. And he says to the Gentiles now, beginning and looking at verse 30, kind of jumping into the context, about man's history, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, that son. You know how he ordained him? He declared him to be the son of God with power and said he's going to dash them in pieces with a potter's vessel. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. He says, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. You know how? In that he raised him from the dead. It was a sign. There was a declaration given there. But it put the world on notice. Now through the message of the Apostle Paul, in early Acts through the message of the Apostles, that Jesus Christ is alive and well, the purpose of God is going on, and he is going to judge the world in righteousness by that man that judgment's coming and he's given assurance a great sign in that he raised him from the dead now some 25 or 30 years later the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an established fact they thought they, would, they were going to get rid of him and he rose from the dead and it's an established fact of history you know why because the tomb is still empty they could never find the body. And, they, and he appeared to 500 at once in that, during that 40-day period. And they knew he was alive. And they watched him go up. The same Jesus as you've, as, as you've watched go into heaven. That was, a, that was a monumental event. That was like the Challenger going off. Um, you know, Kennedy Space Center. They saw him. And it was, and it was seen and witnessed in the, in the immediate area there, they saw him go. And God gave assurance. The resurrection was a great sign. But here, it's a message through another apostle. We need to draw this to a conclusion. Get two passages with me. Get 1 Timothy chapter 2 and get the book of Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. The resurrection meant something to God the Father. He declared on that day, this is my son, this is the heir. Just ask, son, and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And you're going to judge them and take, take the whole, you're going to become the heir of all, of, of all things. But here, 22,000 years later, that still hasn't happened because God had another purpose. And through the Apostle Paul, he makes known, he takes the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And now he proclaims it in a new way. He says in verse 5, There is one God and one mediator. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ... Was, was stricken for his people. He came to save his people from their sins because God had a prophetic purpose in, in view to redeem the world through redeemed Israel. He put that purpose on hold, saved Saul of Tarsus, and now through a new purpose and a new message opens up the merits of the cross and forgiveness and justification to all that believe apart from the law of Moses solely on the basis of grace. And you know what? It's totally apart from the nation of Israel, made known to the Apostle Paul. And he testified that expanded purpose in due time, verse 7, 
whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. The resurrected Christ now is offering salvation to all men everywhere on an individual basis simply by faith. All that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. There's a wonderful grace message now going out. The cross is good news. That darkest hour of human history was the moment in time where God demonstrated his love and his goodness and his grace through the death of his son. And now he's making, made known an expanded purpose that all that believe can come directly to him. Not part of the pro prophetic program, but part of the mystery program committed to the Apostle Paul. The cross was the great stroke of genius of God Almighty, and the resurrection was a declaration that his son was going to be the heir of all things. Now, an expanded purpose today through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. One more verse, Romans chapter 3, verse 25. You know what the cross means to God the Father? The Apostle Paul talks about the but now gospel of the grace of God here. And it demonstrates, the resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrates that God was satisfied. He, the Lord Jesus Christ was made a curse, made sin for us. God put all of our sins on the, on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, God makes the declaration, I'm satisfied. Because it wasn't possible that death could hold him because he fully paid the sin debt of all mankind. He says, the righteousness of God is revealed here in the wonderful gospel of the grace of God. He says in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ gave his life a ransom for all, for your sins and mine. And now salvation is ours as a free gift through the payment that Jesus Christ made on that cross for you and me. And it's received by grace through faith plus nothing. The work is done. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But this time of year, as we think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that empty tomb signifies a finished work. He died on that cross not for his own sin, but for yours and mine, paid the full debt. And when he rose from the dead, God was satisfied. He says in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. The word propitiation means God was satisfied. You know what the resurrection means to God the Father? It means Jesus Christ is the Son. He's the heir. He's going to take possession of the earth one day. But the resurrection also says, I'm satisfied. There is where I'm satisfied. Not with religion, not with the law. You couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. You couldn't keep it. You're justified freely by his grace through my son. All that believe. My friend, it's a wonderful opportunity. In these days of chaos and confusion, the purpose of God still goes forth. The silent heavens are not a sign of God's weakness and his purpose stopping. The message of grace continues to go out, and we have that opportunity to share that wonderful message even today. <laughs> Social distancing. Six, six feet. You can still share the gospel. They can still hear you. <laughs> what a great day it is. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ meant everything to God the Father, and it means everything to us. I hope you know him and are rejoicing in him and resting in all that God is free to do for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him today. If you haven't, if you have trusted him, he means everything to us. And we have the assurance that God's purpose in Christ Jesus now through the body of Christ marches on. What a great day. I appreciate the opportunity to share these times with you. And I trust that, uh, that this is an encouragement to you. Next week, we'll come together and we'll talk about what the resurrection means to you and me. And uh, we, we look forward to, to fellowshipping that way uh, at that time. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. We thank you for the wonderful truths that are here. 
Thank you that the resurrection was a signal to all the world that he was your son. He was the firstborn from the dead. He was the rightful heir because he had totally satisfied and fulfilled all, fulfilled all that needed to be done. And Father, all that's left for us to do is rest in that and rejoice in it and let it fill our hearts with hope and joy and peace. Thank you so much for that great truth. I pray for each one within the sound of my voice that, uh, that they would be resting and rejoicing in that great truth and not be, uh, not be distracted by the things around us, be it uh, unique at this time. But Father, our hope is still secure and our, our purpose in Christ Jesus still marches on and we have a chance to be a part of that. We thank you so much for that. Thank you, Lord, for the saints. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Love you. Miss you. And uh, we'll come together again. Uh, Maranatha.